Hi, I'm Dr. Carol Hardigan. I'm the medical director at the Spine Center. When people come to the spine clinic with spinal stenosis, they often have a picture of a long time of progressive but variable pain in their back and pain in their legs, especially with walking. Often these people are discouraged, they're disappointed, they're frustrated, sometimes they're depressed. A lot of times they think that their symptoms are bound to get worse and that they might end up in a wheelchair. There's quite a bit of fear. I educate people that even though they have degenerative changes on their MRI scans, that it isn't dangerous. If you have spinal stenosis and you come to the Spine Center, you're likely to hear from us that you do not have a dangerous or an unsafe process. We're likely to educate you that it is safe and advisable to remain active and to resume exercise. Some people with spinal stenosis decide they don't want to have formal physical therapy. Yet, they're impaired and they don't have a good tolerance for walking. If they walk in a slightly flexed position, they sometimes can tolerate longer distances. Some ways to do that are to just get on a treadmill and be slightly bent over, or to get on a bike where you're sitting and they can tolerate being fit and active and getting a good cardio workout on the bicycle. Some people use walking poles to give them a slightly flexed posture to get going longer distances. People who are more impaired may use a cane or even a rolling walker to support them while they get their exercise. When people walk every day, they sometimes can build up a greater tolerance for walking and their distance can increase. If people have pain with a certain amount of walking, five or 10 minutes of walking, and they sit, their symptoms often subside, and then they can get up and do another five or 10 minutes. As they do this, sometimes their distances can increase. Other people find that they can tolerate swimming in the swimming pool, taking a water aerobics class, doing a sit-down yoga class. There are so many ways for people to keep moving in spite of the fact that they have spinal stenosis. We encourage people to take advantage of the days when they're feeling good and to be as active as they can possibly be on those days. Those are ways for people to keep active and fit in spite of the fact that they have stenosis without formal treatment. People with spinal stenosis are obviously looking for relief of their symptoms. Many times they're looking for medication. There are certainly many medications that are used for these problems of spinal stenosis and the symptoms of spinal stenosis, but not many of the medications are well proven. Some people find relief with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. They may be taking high levels of Tylenol. Other medicines that are used include opioids and tramadol, and no one's ever proven that opioids improve chronic pain or function and opioids have obviously a lot of negative side effects, including tolerance, dependence, constipation, depression, hormonal disturbance. They also cause hyperalgesia. They make us more sensitive to pain. Gabapentin or Neurontin and pregabalin or Lyrica are two drugs that were developed to treat seizures. They were then highly and heavily marketed by the drug companies for anything for neuropathic pain, for chronic pain, for off-label use. And they have not been shown to make a difference. Anecdotally, some people think gabapentin and Lyrica help them, but most people don't do better with it. When people come into the spine clinic, they have been on so many different kinds of medications. Often I'll tell patients that they have a complicated regimen and I'd like to see it much more simple than it is, and usually they agree. They don't really want to be taking all these medicines. They're sort of a victim of the system in a way. So we'll work on tapering one at a time, and getting them down to the most simple regimen. And if we find that one of them was helpful or seems helpful, we can always reinstate it. People are guarded, they're walking on eggs, they're afraid to move, they anticipate pain with movement, and so they avoid activities. This is what we call kinesiophobia, fear of movement. Over time, they begin to avoid activities, they stop going to the gym, they spiral into more and more deconditioning, and their muscles get weaker and tighter. It takes less to provoke their pain. They become hypersensitive. This is what we call central sensitization. In a sense, in these patients, it takes less of a straw to break the camel's back. In the past, it was felt that exercise could be harmful to people with spinal stenosis, and we know that's not the case. Exercise is healthy for everyone. There are almost 10 good studies that look at physical therapy and exercise for patients with lumbar spinal stenosis, and they show us that exercise in general is a good thing. It improves walking distance, disability, satisfaction, quality of life. 
When people become deconditioned and we recondition them, we improve the teeny tiny little capillary circulation to the muscles, we improve the flow of nutrients and oxygen into the spinal canal, we improve the flow of waste products and inflammation and lactic acid out of the spine. We keep the river flowing and that's a good thing. The other changes that occur with exercise are the muscle fiber diameter increases and the density of muscle fiber enzymes increases over time. And those changes don't happen overnight, they take months to occur. There's a lot of microphysiologic changes that take place, and then there's the macrophysiologic changes of, now I can get up out of a chair, and now I'm not so tight in my hips, and now I'm standing up straighter, and now I feel more sure of myself and more confident. Exercise is the intervention that's shown to make the biggest difference in pain and function in people who have lumbar spinal stenosis. We treat spinal stenosis patients with active, intensive rehabilitation. Some people are able to change from a walker to a cane, or from a cane to not using a cane. Some people get back to the gym. People get back to tennis and golf. People get back to taking care of the grandchildren again. Most of the time, people come back after exercise treatment and they tell us that they're a lot less fearful. If nothing else, they feel safe. My name is Lisa Childs. I'm a physical therapist in the New England Baptist Hospital Spine Program. When a patient is prescribed to come into physical therapy, the first step that occurs is the patient is seen for a initial evaluation. That initial evaluation is for us to understand the background of the patient, their medical history, medications, whatever their past injuries have been. From there, we look at their current physical deficits. So that would include their range of motion, their strength, their lifting limits, their functional limits. The treatment in the program is all goal-directed, but the most important areas of goal setting is with regards to an individual's functional losses. So what we do on initial evaluation is we help the patient go through different categories, including from the time they wake up in the morning and get themselves dressed, to what their day involves, and what has been lost socially and recreationally. When treatment initiates, we take the physical deficits that we've identified on the initial evaluation and begin to work to change them and to bring them to a higher functional level. Exercise and function is safe for patients with stenosis, and so what we do is actually have the patients initiate a process to overcome their fear of lifting when they're with us in the clinic. In treatment, what we're doing is we're actually challenging the patient to come up against that pain threshold related to their back, related to their spinal stenosis, get accustomed to what that limit is, challenge it a bit, the next day challenge it a little bit further. We will initiate a process with the patient of helping them to identify with us what they enjoy doing biking, walking, swimming, and we guide them to begin to progress that outside the clinic so they can enjoy some of their community activities with their family. The educational process within the program is quite important. When a patient comes to us, they are often looking for us to fix them, and we are here to guide them, but truly what we're looking to do is to be a coach. A patient needs to learn how they're going to manage this pain after they're done with their physical therapy. We're really teaching them to learn the steps, to repeat the steps, and to have the confidence that they will be able to continue to enjoy their life with the tools that we provide. Another option for treating the symptoms of spinal stenosis is a spine injection. There are many different types of spine injections. Most of these are for the management of pain, but cannot cure the stenosis. When performed by experienced hands, injections in the spine are extremely safe and can be performed on an outpatient basis. Injections are a very quick procedure. They last about 20 minutes. An x-ray machine is used to guide a very small needle into the back and medicines are injected. The vast majority of people get some form of relief from the injections. The relief is temporary. In some patients it may only last a day or two and in others it may last three or four months. All medicines have some degree of side effects. This includes steroids. For this reason, we pay close attention to the number of injections patients have and monitor them closely for side effects. We use a rule of thumb of approximately three injections a year. Injections do not cure spinal stenosis. Spinal stenosis is a narrowing of the spinal canal. By injecting an anti-inflammatory medicine in the back near where the swollen nerves are in spinal stenosis, we believe that this may help reduce the swelling of the nerves and allow the nerves to make better use of what space they have. There are many different kinds of injections that can be done for spinal stenosis, and it's important to talk with your doctor 
and your spine specialist specifically to help direct you to the correct procedure under the care of the correct specialist. My name is Dr. Scott Tromenhauser. I'm the Chief of Spine Surgery here at the New England Baptist Hospital. Stenosis actually means narrowing, and it refers to anything that's like a tube. So you can have narrowing of a blood vessel, narrowing of the intestine, and in this case, the spinal canal. This is an MRI scan of the lumbar spine. But right here, you can see how very tight it gets. Over here on the cross section, that's what's left of the spinal canal right there. This black material is a thickening of the tissue that contributes to spinal stenosis, among other things such as disc bulging. So they're a combination of things that make this very narrow. In your mind, picture a, an hourglass where it comes down, gets narrow, and then opens up again. All the nerves that go through there get squeezed by this process. All the blood supply to those nerves gets compressed and squeezed. Those nerves go down your legs. So the primary complaint that people have is when they stand and walk, they get more symptoms in their legs. Patients come in with MRIs that look like this, told they have spinal stenosis and need surgery, but it isn't that simple. It comes down to what are the symptoms that you actually have. The decision to move to surgery is based on what your past treatment has been and how successful that has been. If you've tried anti-inflammatory medications, spinal injections and physical therapy, and none of that seems to be working, or it worked at one time and no longer is working, then we start talking about surgery. Well, let me describe the surgery to you. This is the posterior aspect of the spine. You can see the pen marks. This is where all the problems are. And I've described this procedure many times using this model in my office. Here are the bumps that you feel in the middle of your back. This structure that covers the spinal canal, which is right in there where the yellow is, is called the lamina. This is a spinous process. These are the facet joints that help with movement of the spine. When we do the surgery, we're actually performing a laminectomy, which is a removal of the lamina, some or all of it anyway. And in this case, with a stenosis at only one level, we make an incision about this big, this is life size. We're basically making a window right here by removing some of this lamina and some of that lamina. That's where the tight spot is. It's essentially across from the disc, which is right here. Let's go over to the MRI and I'll describe what we do surgically. Again, the, there's bulging disc, there's thickening of the ligamentum flavum projecting into the spinal canal leading to the narrow spot. I pointed out the thickened ligamentum flavum here. Sometimes the facet joints are arthritic and they get overgrown surgically. We uh, take the muscle back to about here. Once we remove the ligamentum flavum and the bit of the lamina and perhaps the inner part of the facet joint, we've recreated the dimensions of the spinal canal. And that's really the goal of the surgery is to make more room for those nerves. Once we do that and we close the wound itself, the muscle comes back across. There's lots of protection between the spinal canal and the skin, and there's really no danger of having that material removed. Spinal stenosis is commonly associated with another condition called degenerative spondylolisthesis. Spondylo means spine, listhesis slip. So we're talking about having one vertebral body slip forward on another. It misaligns the spinal canal. In addition to the laminectomy, you might require a spinal fusion to stabilize those two uh, bones because of the slip. That requires insertion of screws and rods and bone graft commonly. So once you have your surgery, the recovery is actually quite quick. Uh, it takes about three months for everything to heal fully, most of it in the first six weeks, but really you feel much better within a week. The recovery doesn't require that you lay in bed. We encourage our people to get up and start walking immediately. 80 to 90% of patients will see complete relief of their leg symptoms almost immediately. As soon as the pressure's off the nerves, the, the symptoms that are related to that go away. What doesn't go away are the symptoms related to the degenerative changes that cause the stenosis. So people still have back discomfort. My patients often ask me, what would you do, doc, if you were faced with this problem? And I like to think about it this way. Ask yourself the question, am I taking pills every day? Do the symptoms affect me and keep me from doing what I wanna do every day? Does it keep me awake at night? Can I not interact with my family the way I want to? Remember that most of these decisions don't need to be made on an emergency basis. These problems may be affecting you significantly, but most of the time it's not an emergency. You have time to think about it and get additional opinions.